So welcome everyone. Hi Namali. Hi Lee, nice to see you. How are you doing? You too. I'm doing fine. How are you doing? Doing well, doing well. So we're taping this at the beginning of August. And we're both wearing orange today because we are continuing with our series of videos we've been making for our clients and for anyone who wants to learn about this wonderful human development model um, called Spiral Dynamics. And today we are talking about the orange stage and hence we are color coordinated as well with this stage that we're talking about. If anyone is hearing this video by Lee and I today for the first time, if you're interested, we do have uh, lots of other videos that we've been creating at a very introductory basic level, which we think is good for a lot of people who are new to integral theory or human developmental ideas or spiral dynamics. So uh, you can check out our YouTube channel. We have a tiny channel called Practical Integral. We have already done a video on the introduction to spiral dynamics, and we have also done the, the first four stages of beige, purple, magenta, red, and blue, amber. And today we're talking about orange. Um, oftentimes when we speak about these stages, we like to differentiate some of the spiral dynamics and the integral theory color coding system. If any of you are familiar with Ken Wilber's work, you might see that he changed some of these colors. So our previous stage we talked about, which is blue in spiral dynamics, Ken Wilber uh, called it amber. Uh, orange, just like red, remains the same in integral theory. Uh, so orange, let's first talk a little bit about the departure from amber blue and uh, you know what happened for someone to enter orange. So the previous stage uh, of blue amber had a very powerful absolutistic nature to it. It's my, you know, there's a certain, this is our way of being in the world. This is how we do things, very clear lines, usually based on moral uh, codes of conduct uh, of what is right and wrong. And if you sway from that, you could be taken to the Inquisition or you could be pretty severely punished. And so that moral authority to which certain community members within this meme of blue amber would need to adhere to becomes very difficult. And for some people, they begin to see realities outside of their community, for example, that seems valid. Let's say a, a new different kind of family moves next door. And then this family that is perhaps a very strong, strict Catholic family perhaps has now a Hindu Indian family living next to them. And they begin to see that they love their children just as much as we love our children and they want to do uh, well, and they want to accomplish, and they want to be successful, and they're good people. That kind of, that's just a really simple example of how, for some people within this blue and Burmese, their ethnocentric perspective begins to expand a little bit to include others. And to see that, oh, there's, some, there's a world outside of our little bubble. And so that's a really, really good thing. That's a, that's a healthy way of entering orange. Um, for some, it may be a very difficult exit from blue where they got punished for questioning authority. For orange, what we'll begin to talk about in a bit is that they're really willing to question authority. Authority becomes very stifling for them. They want to express themselves. So, which brings me to the topic we've often talked, how every stage in the spiral dynamics model goes from sacrifice self to express self. And so now with orange, we're departing that sacrifice self. I'm tired of sacrificing myself to the group. 
I want to go out of this group and express myself. I have things to say. I have things to uh, accomplish. Um, I want to succeed. So in somewhat of a similar fashion to red, but yet different, um, orange is expressing itself. And orange is a warm color. So we're coming into, we're departing a cool color, which was more collective to a warm color. And now once again, there's a little bit more of an individualistic nature to this stage. It's a lot of cruelty happened in blue, in blue amber, in, in sort of speaking from a perhaps a European context where one could say the Western enlightenment really was more um, dominantly uh, orange would arise out of that Western enlightenment. A lot of religious cruelty took place, for example. And in the meantime, there was also a lot of poverty and disease. The plague, for example, uh, began to destroy great cities like Venice. Um, and uh, Roman cities, a lot of uh, amazing, powerful, well-established, amber, blue, traditional nation states began to suffer under that kind of rule. And they began to see we need out, we need a different approach, a different economy of sorts. And, and so, so begins the beginning of science and logical thinking, and we're no longer just blindly following what you're going to tell us. Our faith is shaken. I am beginning to lose my religion. And I'm going to replace that with more logical, rational outlooks and worldviews. So let me just stop there a little bit, and perhaps you can uh, give us a little bit of uh, the historical beginning uh, or anything that, that, that comes to your mind, Lee. Well, thanks, Romani, for the introduction. And I would say that historically, one of the examples we have of the emergence of the orange level of development or value mean is from about 2,500 years ago in um, of Pythagoras, uh, uh, a Greek mathematician who lived approximately 500 uh, BC or BCE. And he and the followers that he had would compare the lengths of strings. So they would um, stretch strings out and see what would happen if they plucked the strings. So sort of like plucking the strings on a guitar or uh, hitting the strings on a piano. And they would see what happened if they had particular lengths of strings. And one of the things they saw is that if you have a string with, let's say, a, a length of a meter, and then you have another string with the same materials uh, of a length of half a meter, so the half of the original string, and you pluck them both at the same time, you'll hear the same note, but only uh, the string of half, half a length will be an octave higher. But it, it'll create a very harmonious sound. And so they started experimenting with different string lengths, and they sort of philosophized about the, the way the world is constructed, um, in relation to sound and to mathematical equations and um, ratios. So that's the very rudimentary beginnings, historically, we can see of an approximation of sort of a scientific method where you sort of try to um, do experiments in the world and see what you can deduce from them and see if you can find out how nature works or how the world works and um, then build on that theory. So a couple of hundred years later, so let's say in uh, uh, approximately 350 uh, BC or BCE, we have Aristotle, another Greek philosopher, who was seen as the father of many scientific disciplines. And one of the things he basically did was to also observe nature and to document what he observed and to categorize and systematize the knowledge. So what we could say about the orange level of development or value meme is that it tries to derive from the material measurable world axioms about how reality is constructed and, and what is real and what is not real. Yeah, really interesting. It is, it's sort of 
the like you said with Pythagoras and Aristotle and all these people that go actually way back around 2500 years ago in the in the west and then also in the east with uh, people like the Buddha who came and and taught things like don't just believe what I say you need to undertake the injunction of the practice practice it and then find out for yourself what it does or doesn't do for you so these are really interesting ways uh, that some people began to introduce uh, observation self-observation and observing the mind so just really interesting um, dynamics we're not going to just see things or see the world and just assume that this is God. Um, we're going to check it out. We're going to explore. We'll have experiments like how does this guitar string sound as opposed to that guitar string or, you know, whatever. Um, and comparing mind. It just is the rise of this era that feels we have the right and the freedom to explore. And it's really a, a, a beautiful freedom that blue amber traditional society and culture didn't afford them. So perhaps just to draw a few lines of connection, I guess uh, if, we, if we weren't using colors, some of the more common uh, terms that we would use for this stage are the rational stage, the modernist stage, modernity. Um, it is the world that is happy to reason with you, needs to reason with you. It is now entering world-centric. I don't really know if I completely believe that orange is entirely world-centric. It is, like we've said before, every stage is quite deeply connected to the previous stage and the, the stage that is going to emerge for, for them later. So, so there is uh, an individualistic nature to this stage. Um, if you speak about Robert Keegan stages, this is the self-authoring stage. Um, I get to construct my own reality to some degree. I'm not, I'm not a prisoner to the social, con the, the, the way society tells me how I need to be. We often talk about Jean Piaget, cognitive levels of development. This would be the formal operational stage of development. So one can, one begins to be able to hold multiple perspectives and abstract perspectives. Um, I can take into things that aren't, I don't need things to be concrete in front of me, which was the previous stage, the concrete operational stage. Um, I can take the perspective that you may hold, um, concepts and ideas. Uh, it doesn't have to be this boxy, tangible thing in front of me. Uh, Eric Erickson, stages of ego development. This is the identity versus confusion stage. So you could really clearly see around age 12, preteens to teens, when till kids are really starting to get a sense of this is who I am. Um, teenagers especially really want to express themselves. They begin to have a sense of sort of what kinds of clothes they like or what kinds of music they like. They begin to band with others who are in that similar uh, group. And there's a lot of confusion when they don't know how, when they don't have a clear sense of who am I. This is uh, uh, the win the stage of the winners and losers. Uh, previously, it was saints and sinners, and so this is winners and losers. Um, what are some of the values? What What would you like to add, We? If we look at the domain of music, then we can see the evolution of these levels of development. Um, uh, as they pass through each level. So for instance, if we look at music at the beige level of development, we could say that uh, at that level, we use music to, for self-soothing, to feel better um, uh, physically. And at the purple level of development or magenta, we could say that um, 
we use music together with our tribe or our clan um, in honor of ancestors or to, um, um, to appease spirits or um, to evoke certain um, uh, results, for instance, rain dances, like you mentioned uh, during our purple call. And at the red level of development, we, of course, can have music as war songs or as um, um, celebration of uh, victories and things like that. And at the blue level of development, music becomes much more devotional. So it's much more in service of uh, a transcendental um, reality or a god or a, a, a deity of whichever uh, form. And then as we get to orange, music is used and produced more for entertainment's sake and uh, just for sake of beauty and um, um, as something to be enjoyed and to be consumed. And of course, as we get to uh, the green level of development, which we'll be moving into uh, uh, on our next call, we get more to a self-expressive uh, type of music. So that's one way we can very quickly um, move through those levels of development that we've been discussing. And to reflect on your question about the uh, values of uh, the orange level of development, one very beautiful thing you pointed to is the exploratory nature of orange, where we're basically at the orange level of development or value mean we're moving out into the world and exploring and just experimenting and making use of the freedom of movement that we have and that we um, basically take upon ourselves. So we could say that oranges express self in all sorts of directions and with much adventurous spirit. So that's one of the values I would say of orange. And also the Basically, to make things measurable is also a very valuable um, um, trait. So if we think of the orange level of development in society, as many of us experience it today, then we can think of targets that companies have, uh, key performance indicators, um, graphs, statistics, um, all sorts of uh, ways to structure our economic activity. So we could say that the orange level of development is also very entrepreneurial because it's it's comfortable with taking risks, sometimes a little bit too comfortable, and it's, it enjoys very large rewards. So the winner and loser framework that you just sketched is, is very much applicable, of course, here is from the orange level of development, we can sometimes view life as a game where we try to um, come out on top and, um, and basically any way we see fit. So um, cheating is also uh, allowed if, as long as the results are obtained. So we could say that at Orange, one of the themes is the end justifies the means. So um, as long as you get the, uh, get the medal, it doesn't matter how you got there. So, so there's also something in that, a determination, there's um, a continual sense of innovation and renewal to optimize performance and to acquire skills. Uh, so those are some of the values that I see in orange. Uh, what are your reflections on that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, you said measurable. It's almost as though for orange, if something isn't measurable, it isn't real. <laughs> it's, you have to be able to quantify if you cannot quantify even something like a, uh, intelligence orange figured out to create an iq test it's like you get a score and if you cannot if you don't get a score it's probably not not real or doesn't doesn't require our energy and our effort or our attempt at trying to understand that so it is the industrial age you know it's sort of beginning the industrial age the values are very industrious um, however, um, unlike red, orange has a sense for others around me. Orange really values autonomy, but it sees that there's a whole world out there and the whole world is means for me to make a deal and I need others to make a deal. And sometimes orange is really smart at 
figuring out with whom can we make a deal so that we all win. It isn't necessarily about how do I win. Orange definitely has a lot of red and has a lot of amber blue as well. Um, so the two of them together almost creates this perfect storm for orange to really put myself out there and go for it, go for the kill. But I know how to involve others and engage others to do that. So that's a really good thing. Um, there's a test for everything. They know how to show respect to others to get what they want. And they know how to judge who they need to communicate with. Material gain is power. Uh, material abundance is obviously quantifiable. It's measurable. So they love it. Faith believes feelings, emotions, intuitions, uh, even while modernists themselves are using all of that, they don't actually know it so much, the value of emotions or intuition. They, they sort of don't really, the orange stage doesn't pay attention to that uh, because it's not measurable in the way that they know using sort of empirical measuring systems. They cannot measure these things. Therefore, it's too woo-woo or too fuzzy to use really technical terms. They go after what they value. They value stability, security, the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness straight from the US Constitution. Um, success, achievement, bragging rights, having bragging rights. Um, don't give me limitations, constraints, uh, boundaries. I will break them. There's just too much potential out there. That's what our orange tends to see. There is a strong line, delineation between subject and object in orange. So the first sort of that, that objective perspective taking begins here. They, do, they may not see that they're doing it, that they're actually able to separate subject from object. Um, they have somehow a preference to the objective world even though they're using subjective intelligence and emotionality and all of it to make those discriminations or take those discern discernments. Facts and figures, efficiency, productivity, strategy, skill building, competency, expertise, capitalism, uh, liberalism, free speech, separation of state and um, church, separation of uh, church and state is, again, that the church is the traditional, we don't want that. Uh, the world of business or governance has to be separate from the church. Yes, so you mentioned industriousness, which is indeed a very uh, clear characteristic of the orange level of development or value mean. And historically, we can see that uh, industriousness, for instance, in the uh, trading cities of uh, Venice and Milan and Genoa and Florence. And also in, in the Netherlands, where I live um, in 1602, one of the first, one of the largest uh, global corporations was founded, the Dutch East India Company. And they traded in spices, um, in sugarcane wine and uh, coffee the industriousness was very much a part of the um, the endeavor and at a certain point the dutch east in india company even had their own army to defend their their settlements in um, in places where they had a foothold for trading and another thing the dutch east india company did also in 1602 was create the one of the earliest known stock exchanges, the Amsterdam Stock Exchange in Amsterdam, where I live. So that's about 420 years ago. That's also one of the things that, as you say, measurability and numbers, they also come together, of course, in the stock exchange and in uh, the finance um, industry. And as you said, the Industrial Revolution, we can see the earliest traces of that around 1712 when uh, Thomas Newcomen creates an atmospheric engine, and that was one of the first commercially successful um, engines that could power machines. So beforehand, of course, before uh, 
all of those developments and um, and discoveries, most things had to be done either by human labor, um, muscle power, or by animal uh, muscle power. But of course, with the invention of machines and their uh, commercial success across the globe, societies are transformed in ways that are really significant and also indeed very measurable. And that's also when we see the rise of industrialized cities and large portions of the population moving from uh, rural areas to the uh, industrialized cities because of better work opportunities there. One other thing that comes to my mind is we talked about how traditional stage was really around agriculture and its means of economy. Um, And moving to the industrial stage There's a lot of industrial innovation um, and machinery and technology that women can now participate in. So the using the plow, for example, in your community and in your farm to grow food and harvest food, those kinds of um, tools of the traditional era, historically speaking, women had to step aside from that because using machinery like that was too heavy for the female body and biologically true. Um, And so they would lose pregnancies and such. So looking back, that was a very natural reason for men and women to, in some ways, separate themselves, which in the eyes of the mo- in the modern eye, that's sort of the beginning of patriarchy in some, some ways. But the modern era actually give us more equality because now women can um, partake in the economy much more than they could uh, in the historical traditional stage. So that's, that's a win. It, it's something that is still to be celebrated. And also, I guess the modern stage eventually puts an end to the traditional forms of slavery. Although Orange would create its own forms of modern slavery eventually, but um, you know, as, as Ken Wilber would often say, there is no uh, traditional slavery in any country that has a McDonald's in it, <laughs> which is kind of a funny, simplistic way of uh, saying that the, the modernity ends slavery of the traditional stage. I guess just to speak a little bit more about where do we see this stage, um, we see it everywhere around us. We're using this technology right now. I mean, we wouldn't have any of this if not for this modern, industrious, rational, scientific, orange stage. So it's in the entire business world. It's in education. It's in science, research, um, technology, Hollywood, uh, and the fashion industry, I guess, is at the center of orange in many ways. You'll see more uh, green entering the fashion industry now, but primarily it's still very much an, uh, a very uh, modern industry. Orange, because of its industrious and, and that mindset of optimization, it knows how to cut deals. It knows how to win. So Orange learns that it can sell. This is, again, something that I heard from Ken Wilber. You can sell Bibles to traditional and yoga mats to postmodern stages. So we haven't talked about postmodern yet, but uh, Orange is so smart in that way. They are really good at noticing patterns. And they know how to optimize and leverage um, on those patterns. The startup world, Silicon Valley, any modern city has a startup hub. And that's an amazingly beautiful place that Orange gets to go innovate, disrupt, and explore to their heart's desires. Creativity, the world of cryptocurrency, a lot of isms like capitalism, capitalism, materialism, secularism, atheism, uh, I guess also agnos, how do you say it? Agnosticism, did I say that correctly? Agnosticism. 
Um, this is the world of self-development. If you go to a bookstore and the self-improvement section of here's how to become a great secretary or <laughs> here's how to become a great boss, a lot of this sort of self-improvement industry it, it begins out of orange um, self-improvement. You see orange in the U.S. Constitution, perhaps in many constitutions around the modern, uh, around the Western world, especially um, individualism, free trade, uh, deregulation. Uh, the sort of the common phrases we hear, such as rags to riches, and uh, the sky is the limit. How can we kill two birds with one stone? Uh, so these things kind of bring orange to mind as uh, its industriousness. Certainly. And it's also, of course, uh, interesting to note so, uh, some of the discoveries that orange has uh, um, done. So, for instance, um, in 1953, I, I believe it was uh, um, Watson Crick and um, Franklin who discovered, of course, the double helix of DNA. And there have been so many advances since that we're now currently able through CRISPR to alter genomic sequences to such a degree that we can play around with life in a, in a very both inspiring and very scary way. So um, that's uh, another testament to the power of orange to uh, innovate and to discover and to make things possible. And also within the field of medicine, for instance, the fact that you can um, receive anesthesia and go under and be operated on, that is also, of course, the um, due to the uh, developments within the medical sciences. And for instance, the development of the uh, COVID vaccines across the world, that's also a very orange endeavor many more such uh, developments like the pacemaker and all sorts of uh, medications for parkinson's and things like that so um, it's endless yeah i mean the the advancement of the world uh the innovations of the world the the, the just about everything we take for granted um is an invention of the scientific mind the mind that was willing to let go of God <laughs> and believe that if I work hard and I explore and I think objectively, I can create endlessly. And yeah, absolutely. The, the idea of the free will. Um, so yeah, uh, while traditional valued preservation, conservation. Uh, Orange does too, but the modern the modernist comes in and sort of is willing to throw all that, you know, and just say, I want to throw all that away and just go go explore and research and find novelty. Novelty and change are welcome in in the modern modernist stage thus giving rise to everything you mentioned and and just millions more i mean the kinds of technology and uh, environmental sciences and uh, i mean, yeah it's it's never ending would you also say that colonialism you know the western mind imagining that we can just walk into other countries and just make money out of that is that is colonialism considered modern or is that more ethnocentric? That's a very good question. I, I don't have a very clear answer, but there's something about the, the expansionism of, um, of colonialism and the profiteering that, that is very orange and also the fact that it's so global and, um, and so lucrative. At the same time, indeed, there does seem to be a very clear undercurrent of we versus them. So that would be indeed more of a blue, um, amber, ethnocentric uh, perspective. So perhaps we could say that the, the adventurism of people exploring uh, other countries is very orange, and then the profiteering of that also. 
but the the perspective that the people who are then uh, subjected to um, foreign rule through indeed um, uh, some of the empires of the of, um, recent history, that that is very blue in the sense that it's the imposition of one system of values onto um, onto different colonies across the world. What yeah. Do you think? Yeah, no, I think that sounds right. Um, it's basically, there is that red expansion idea is very much a part of the orange mindset as well. How can we optimize? How can we expand our power? Um, oh, orange is is the land of the trophy, you know? It's the, it's the, I guess sort of, you know, just to be a little bit funny around this, but we often say the trophy wife or the sugar daddy. Um, these <laughs> kind of concepts are sort of orange concepts, I guess. They love recognition and reward. Um, they're, they're quite okay with hierarchy, even though there's more equality in orange, they're very comfortable with hierarchy. Who said the top, who said the bottom winner? The winner is at the top, the loser is at the bottom. Let's talk a little bit about uh, it's kind of the real true honor and dignity of orange. And then we'll go into the disaster also. Uh, I guess dignities are optimism. This is this an unending quench for you know, success and, and exploration and finding out new things, uh, potential. Um, factual truth will trump that blind faith. That's a good thing. Um, experimentation, research, bold, ambitious, bold ambition, uh, unafraid to question authority, courage. They are also able to create um, in a certain way win-win situations as well. Or orange is sometimes orange knows how to do that in order to make cut a deal, um, negotiation, that kind of thing. Um, more future oriented, or the the not that that's necessarily a dignity, but but it has its value to be able to think more. Uh, future-oriented progressively so that there is an openness and a curiosity of that which is unknown yet. Anything you want to add to that? Yes, I, I would say that orange is also mostly responsible for raising the level of, of living standards across the entire globe so that the number of people who have been lifted out of poverty through um, orange inventions and orange markets and orange financial systems and uh, incentives uh, that to me would also be uh, uh, one of the dignities of orange yeah orange gave us calories until then we can go into the disaster <laughs> yeah yeah i guess the disasters are um you know unfortunately later just as bad as the innovation and the wonders of orange i think one the wonders mm -hmm. of orange still are extremely valuable and necessary and the destruction of the environment there's a cold calculated way of doing things in orange uh, manipulative um, business practices where only you win and there is a lot of exploitation, which you alluded to earlier. Also, if you if optimizing means uh, exploitation, they will do it. Um, so some really amazing movies. We often talk about movies like Blackwater, which I know you have seen. Um, I, I think it was Dark Water. Dark Waters. Yes. Do I sorry. Think, yeah. Dark Waters. Yeah. Interestingly, Blackwater, is that mm. Blackwater is also, I think that's yeah. the document, yes, but also the, the documentary about the exploitation of whales. Um, I think that's called Blackwater. I, I, may, I may be wrong. But anyhow, yeah, I mean, if you can grab it to make a buck, go for it. You know, basically that's orange. So there's abuse without any regard to the trail of destruction that you might leave behind. One of the ways that we could summarize it is 
that orange is very future oriented but very short sighted so the the window uh, on the on the future is very small and it's indeed um the long term consequences of uh, orange's actions are not always uh, clear to itself and today as we're recording this it's exactly um, 76 years ago that the atomic bomb was dropped on uh, uh, Nagasaki. Mm -hmm. And th three days before, of course, uh, the first bomb was dropped on uh, Hiroshima. The invention of ways to obliterate things is, also, is absolutely one of the disasters of Orange. And if we look, for instance, at the concentration camps created by the Nazi uh, war machine, then uh, those were also ways in which people were killed in an industrial way. So basically yeah. sort of a conveyor belt of death. Well, well, that's the day that is the unforeseen uh, dangers that that had that really came out of orange, the modern mind was required to build technologies for the good and the bad. So there are certain technologies that are that's just technology, but in the hands of traditional or egocentric sort of the the warrior mindset, what you do with orange technology can be extremely dangerous. So uh, another classic example that comes up is, um, you know, orange develops the you know the aviation industry and planes, and then the Taliban or you know, the, um, not the okay. Taliban, uh, the Al-Qaeda would then use that technology to, you know, fly into buildings and kill several thousand people. I think we haven't discussed this yet, but one of the dignities, or at least one of the characteristics of Orange in the efficiency um, domain is, for instance, the creation of literal conveyor belts and of the um, the splitting out of tasks in a complex production process, for instance, the way that Henry Ford did it, to break down the creation of a car, so the assembly of a, of a car, into very small uh, actions, and then to allocate one person per action, and to have them do the same thing repetitively over and over again each day, so that the production process is as efficient as possible. And of course, Ford is... Uh, being quoted as, uh, as having said um, that the disadvantage of a pair of, of hands is that there's always a brain attached. So in other words, <laughs> the people who had to do those tasks, they weren't yes. very happy with them, of course. Yes. Um, but from the orange perspective, it's, um, it's hassle indeed that people have individuality because you would want them to uh, behave like machines so you could uh, optimize the entire production process. So yeah. speaking about films, one film that I've always enjoyed is Modern Times by Charlie Chaplin, where he, he's basically one of the scenes is he's working in a factory and then sort of um, ends up in the conveyor belt system. And uh, it's, it's quite common. Yeah. So. yeah, I think I, I remember that scene, even though I haven't seen the movie, I think. Yeah, it's funny. The, you know, Orange, the modernity invents the factory line. And it, however, to succeed in the factory line, it's almost like you need the traditional mindset. So the traditional factory worker might actually just go and do that job year after year after year working in the factory line. But if you, once you evolve to a modern mindset, um, that's the time that you'll often hear the stories of this is crazy making. I, I don't want to sit here and do the same thing year after year after year. I need to go find something else. Orange knows how to game the system. And it's the Bernie Madoffs of the world that there's plenty of them still who just know how to exploit and win at all costs. Of course, there's the film The Wolf of Wall Street, which is very um, ugly orange uh, indeed. There's a lot. I mean, orange is all over in so many movies and, and music and other places where you see orange, the, the sort of the political el elite as well, the Hollywood elite, Forbes magazine and Fortune magazines and fashion magazines, the entire world of big data, pretty much that. The, the analytical mindset 
Amazon and Google, everybody's driven by data. Uh, some movies that come to my mind that really see uh, some of these different stages and these different worldviews. Uh, Avatar was a very clear fight between orange and green. Again, we haven't still talked about green, but I don't know if you saw Avatar. Did you see Avatar? There's a lot of orange trying to take over, you know, which is what they do. And there is uh, in one of my all time favorite movies, The Dead Poets Society, there's a training that the Robin William uh, uh, character is trying to bring to this, these young men is to break the shackles of traditional so, uh, way of thought in academia, in, in, in the way that you study. So there's that very lovely scene where he's trying to get the boys to march across the courtyard in their own unique way. And there's one guy who steps aside and chooses not to do that. So they bring in humor. Orange has humor in it. Orange welcomes humor. So the world of comedy, for example. So there were these young men who were walking in really funny ways and they were willing to not be so rigid, which is the training that they received from this school, very traditional school. And there was one guy who steps aside and he says, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to exercise my individual right to not do what you're asking us to do, which is also a very orange uh, ideal. And Robin William appreciates that in that in that moment. So Devil Wears Prada. It shows how this young woman got sucked into orange and uh, realizes the, the downfall of it, the highly image conscious, win at all cost mindset. Um, I think Little Miss Sunshine has a lot of sort of really sweet, healthy blue of trying to accomplish and win. And uh, the little girl wants to win the, the, the beauty competition. The father had a sort of an executive coaching or a training business that he was desperately trying to uh, trying to sell to his clients and he wasn't winning. Dangerous Beauty, another one of my absolute favorite movies of all time. It's based in uh, uh, the in Venice and really clearly shows how if you told the lines, uh, you would be taken to the Inquisition. So this woman who was a courtesan was actually orange and perhaps even green higher and was really threatening to the traditional mindset of Venice at the time. Um, and you can really see these different stages and especially how her individual individuality was a threat. So let's explore some of the ways in which we can integrate the orange level of development or value meme into our daily lives as modern human beings. So a few ways that we can do that is, for instance, um, to make to-do lists, to take action steps, to formulate measurable goals, to take action and to evaluate our actions and then to adapt our strategy and to continue to take steps until we achieve results and then to celebrate the achievements we've um, we've been able to uh, manifest. And um, one of the things I know that you do is you help people to create a, a mission statement. So I would say that mission and vision statements are also very orange and can be very useful in making clear to ourselves what our most important goals are so that we can take action towards achieving. What else yeah. would you say? Yeah, I mean, also, uh, it brings to mind that we are talking right now, just as the Olympics have ended, come to an end in Tokyo. And just as a sort of the whole world of sports and trophies, this is very much goal setting uh, and training. Um, that's that sense of dedication. That's all really brilliant orange as well. And you can see how in the Olympics, the kind of the fight for the medals and all of that is really orange. So, yeah, I think you covered everything as far as sort of how to integrate orange into our lives. It is 
generally speaking, it's the entire world of sports training, corporate training, uh, executive coaching, self-development. Um, all of that is self-improvement in a way. It's, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would also add uh, risk-taking, appropriate risk-taking, opportun seizing opportunities, and um, also to, um, for instance, very simple things like dressing for success and uh, projecting a successful image, marketing, branding, all the things in those veins are also very orange, in my opinion. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. Like you don't, there are, there, there are entire kind of industries of image consulting, for example. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And there's nothing wrong with any of that. It's just it's the it's just the the, the modern mindset. Perhaps we can go into oh by the way I think we can't not mention um, Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged, which <laughs> for a lot of people at least in the U.S. it seems like that's a book that really cost for a lot of people to uh, come into understanding the modern mindset. Uh, with such a clear yep. departure from the traditional mindset for a lot of people. I haven't read that book myself personally, by the way. So absolutely, there is uh, critical thinking, objective thinking. These are things that we can integrate into our lives to really take a critical perspective without the sort of the emotional <laughs> drama that we often bring to uh, the ways in which we take make decisions, for example, but that time or that point at which when we can set aside that, but just take a really objective, principled view of what's necessary, um, that's a, a, a modern way, or that's a way to integrate modernity into our lives as well. So Lee, maybe we can end with um, just talking a little bit about the departure from Orange. You know, what what triggers the departure from orange for, um, for some? So I would say for many people, this kind of in America, for example, working to live, working your butt off to, for the American dream, for example, getting the, the American dream is a real orange concept of like buying the big house and the big car and the, the perfect job and mm -hmm. sending your kids mm -hmm. to the perfect school and the, the perfect image and all of that. That constant focusing on optimizing and winning the competition, competition of orange just becomes exhausting, I think. And people will lose no matter how hard you try, some people will lose. And especially when they work so hard to build something, whether it's a marriage or a business, the, the misfortune of the loss of that causes people to enter a little bit of their interior domain. And the other thing is also this this constant drive to win um, and then eventually failing causes some people to feel like a victim. That point at which you begin to feel like I'm a victim and perhaps it extends to I'm a victim of the system perhaps is also the beginning stages of the next stage of evolution in the post-modernity, post, post entering post-modernity. Um, I worked so hard. I tried to do everything I can. I was very uh, dedicated and committed. And still, I didn't win. And that causes this frustration and also leads to isolation and depression and anxiety. These are all diseases of modernity. America is said to be the most highly medicated society in the world. This country that has some of the least number of uh, uh, holidays in the world. So people work really hard in this country. There's no vacation. The concept of taking a month off, for example, like Europeans do, is unheard of here, you know, still. So um, 
physically, mentally, emotionally, I think you're run down. You are burnt out. And those are some of the ways in which uh, orange begins to hurt really bad. I agree. And historically, I would add that people who've lived through the 20th century, where the First World War produced 20 million dead, the Second World War produced 75 million dead, there's a sense also that, and we mentioned the atomic bomb earlier, of course, there's a sense in which it's as if hum humanity is destroying itself and we need some sort of interior wisdom to go with our technological developments and the large-scale degradation of the uh, of the natural world where we have mass deforestation and uh, overfishing uh, causing um, the oceans to be depleted of, uh, of nutrients and, and of uh, living beings, of course. And indeed, the factory farming where we become sensitive to the plight of animals and to how we're, as a species of are treating animals in, in many cases uh, in, in ways that if we would treat human beings like that, we would um, immediately be horrified. So all of that indeed, and together with what you're saying, creates the context for the sensitive self of green to emerge and um, to become susceptible to look inside of ourselves indeed and to inhabit the subjective aspects of life and of uh, uh, and to do that together in a community yeah yeah even modernity encounters a little bit of guilt which causes them to depart yeah true yeah. excellent so next time we'll further investigate the green level of development or value mean so thanks everyone for watching and thanks namali yeah, thank you, Lee. Let's uh, explore post-modernity next time. And we'll be wearing green next time.